hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Well, I, I think the, the motivation for this talk um, kind of dovetails off Kurt's presentation because I, I think one of my motivations is to, to make sure uh, we collaborate across the Great Lakes a little bit better in terms of science sharing and, and how we may be attacking an issue like water levels. Um, we actually have a call uh, this afternoon on that across the Great Lakes. Um, but I, I just want to kind of increase that uh, going forward. Um, and this presentation, uh, you know, is, is kind of a, a state of the Great Lakes, kind of where we're at right now and what we're dealing with up here. You know, so a lot of Central Region obviously doesn't have a Great Lake, um, and, and we're we're definitely fighting a fight up here right now with erosion and, and flooding and that kind of thing. So I'll, the first, you know, maybe half of this is kind of the state of the Great Lakes, and then the back half is a couple topics, uh, you know, very related to water levels. One is, is kind of short-term water level rises, and I'm going to kind of do a, a real quick uh, look at medial tsunamis in the Great Lakes. Uh, and then the, the very back end of the, the presentation is about the, the water level model, the FBCOM. Uh, that that has become operational on Lakes Michigan and Huron in the last year, and we've been using it pretty extensively in Grand Rapids uh, from last fall to the current time, and we have found really great results with that. So that's kind of an overview of the presentation. Uh, this slide is is kind of a a look into our world up here and what we're dealing with right now. Um, and I covered a lot of the Great Lakes, but it, it's definitely going to be focused into my area of expertise, which is, is Lake Michigan. And in western lower Michigan here specifically, uh, we, we've got every county dealing with something that looks like this. This is down in IWX with CWA in Stevensville, Michigan in Berrien County. This is kind of a private road that the lake has um, what I like to call chewed the dune, and it is uh, creating a steep face and, and we are losing trees and roads and in some cases worse than that. Um, so this is, you know, one, one snapshot into what we're dealing with here in the Great Lakes. Um, same county, uh, IWX and CWA, uh, the inset there, you can see this home that is perched on the dune. Um, a reporter somehow got beneath it here and took a picture up, up the dune face. Uh, you can see that you know, their deck is hanging, um, and I'm not sure where this home sits at this point, um, but they were not in a good place when this picture was taken back in December. Um, a lot of homes have tried to put in armoring, uh, either riprap rocks, which you kind of see uh, closer to the their dune face there, and then, then they'll put in armoring stone uh, as well, and these, these fixes are, number one, really expensive. Uh, you know, from what I've seen, they, they, they cost you know, on the order of near or over six figures to do. Um, and then the, the other thing is, is the impact. When you do this, you're affecting shoreline up and down the coast. You're, you're affecting the, the transport of sand, you know, so your neighbors are really taking it on the chin if they don't have the same uh, stuff in place uh, because you are, you're creating, you know, eddies and you're eroding on the edge of this, this rock that goes in. Um, you often see that where one home will protect and the homes on either side uh, are losing major, major property. Um, so that can't be good for neighborly relations. Um, this is a, a picture from up in Gaylord's CWA. This is the city of Petoskey. This is a bike trail that runs from Petoskey to Charlevoix. And this was uh, just a week or so ago. They lost a 100-yard section of this bike path, which I doubt they'll be able to, looking at that slide that occurred, I, I doubt they're going to be able to refill that back in. It would not be cost effective to do that. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with this bike path. So the next three pictures here are kind of a series. Uh, this is back in 2011. Um, you know, what I want you to notice here is the depth of the beach from the water line to the base of the dune. You've got probably 50, 60 yards of, you know, dune grass and beach. You know, they've got a buffer here to deal with any kind of wave or water level push. And notice the the face of the, the dune, you know, that's covered here with dune grass and grass, uh, maybe even some shrubs. It's it's pretty steep. If you look at those stairs, um, you know, the one on the left is, you know, almost looks like a ladder, but it, it's it's probably walkable, um, but pretty steep. Uh, but there is a little bit of a slope to it. And, and notice the house where I have the red X on. Um, you can see their deck. There's a little bit of grass beyond the deck and the edge of uh, the dune there. 
we'll, we'll jump forward here to last summer, uh, you know, about an eight-year jump. The, the beach is gone. The dune face has become more vertical. The stairs uh, closest to the, the house in question uh, are gone. Um, I'm kind of wondering if those other stairs are actually just hanging there at this point. Um, but this, this home is now perched. You know, it, it is not in a good place. So that was uh, an eight-year jump uh, from 11 to 2019. And you, you can probably guess where the next picture is going. This is January. Uh, it went over the edge. Uh, we've had a couple do this. We've had multiple homes, uh, uh, you know, a number of homes that have been moved back where, where owners have moved their entire home, you know, back further on their property away from the lake. The lady that owned this home had mentioned that when she was a young girl, I think back in the 50s, 60s, uh, that the home was so far back from the lake that they couldn't see the lake through the trees. So, you know, this is an ongoing long-term erosion process that goes on and um, they lost they lost the battle. I think uh, I remember seeing in the news that she actually started a, a GoFundMe page to help get this debris off, you know, off the dune and, and out of the lake. And I don't I don't know exactly where that stands at this point, but this was back in January, early January of this year. This is uh, Montague, Michigan is a little north of Muskegon, so uh, west central lower Michigan. So, you know, the Great Lakes sit between 41 and 49 north latitude, you know, kind of on the business end of the westerlies. And, uh, you know, we, we produce a lot of systems that create wind and waves. And this process has been going on all winter. And, you know, our EMs are, are in a pretty good fight here for trying to help these people out as much as, much as they can. So this, this was an interesting picture that I, I thought I would throw in here. This is Stony Point near Monroe. This is Western Lake Erie in Detroit's CWA. I believe this was, you know, a year or so ago is my gut feel, and I, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what this situation is like on Stony Point now. Um, lake Erie is, is a shallow bathtub, and, you know, it, it sloshes a lot more than other lakes do. Um, it's, it's more prone to wind stress because it's shallow. Um, so I, if I was a homeowner in, in Stony Point, I would be concerned given where the lake levels are, especially the lakes upstream of Lake Erie and what, uh, what those lakes are sending to Lake Erie. Um, something to kind of note in this picture in the, the bottom right there, the White House uh, with the double roof, if you look close enough, you can see that the spray is all the way up onto the second level from where these waves are crashing into a seawall. So it's not just small towns and, you know, dunes uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Big cities are also dealing with this. Uh, the Chicago Lakefront Trail back in January underwater. Um, you know, the, the wind and wave set up for Chicago is, is a, a north or a northeast flow, especially a northeast wind um, is, is their worrisome mode. And that's what set up in early January. And, uh, you know, it, if it's a big enough push, you can get water over the trail you know, over, over a wall and even on the Lakeshore Drive, which is what the, the picture in the top right is showing from WLS. So, you know, kind of a system profile for those that don't know, you know, um, Lake Superior is, is the highest lake. It, it's at the highest elevation. It, it flows through the St. Mary's River and the Sioux Locks into Lake Michigan Huron, which, you know, hydrologically is considered one lake. They're connected at the strait. And I, I will show you something on that that's pretty interesting at, at the very end of this from the FBCOM water model. Um, Lake Michigan flows through Lake St. Clair, the St. Clair River, the Detroit River into Lake Erie. And then Lake Erie uh, flows into Lake Ontario with the Niagara River and Niagara Falls. So that's kind of the, the basic setup. They're all interconnected. Uh, and all of the lakes are well above normal at this point, um, if not near record. So something to keep in mind, the Great Lakes Drainage Basin is massive. Um, it's almost 300,000 square miles, you know, including the lakes themselves. Um, you know, so this stretches all the way from north of Thunder Bay, Ontario, all the way to Oswego, New York. Uh, and, and that drainage basin is, is larger than Texas. So when we're in a wet period, um, there, there's a, a lot of surface area for, for this to go. And, I'll show you here in a couple slides where we've stood with precipitation, and precipitation really is the driving factor as to why we're in such kind of a bad state. 
So the one, three, and five-year state precipitation ranks uh, over the area, uh, this is from NCEI, over about 125 years' worth of data. And if you look at Michigan, which is a sizable chunk of the Great Lakes uh, drainage basin as a whole, we, have, we are in the wettest one, three, and five-year periods in that 125-year record. And if you look, you know, at the, at the five-year precipitation on the far right, most of the states that drain into the Great Lakes are in their wettest five-year period ever. So there really isn't a question and as to why we're in the state we're in. Uh, we, we have been going up um, year by year in, in regard to precipitation. So just a, one small snapshot. This is the Grand River in Grand Rapids, downtown Grand Rapids. It's Michigan's longest river. Um, this is looking at a water year from October 1st through September 30th. Each line on the, the graph is, is a water year. Uh, so you can see in the, the black line is the median. Uh, the 25th to 75th percentiles are shaded in green. And looking at the last four years here, 2017, 18, and 19 in blue, we're you know, near the, the top of the spread. And 2020, we are in clearly in first place, unfortunately. Um, the interesting thing to look at is the median water flow by the end of the year, um, we surpassed the amount of water that normally flows through Grand Rapids in one year. We surpassed it in January. Uh, you know, so in four months, we did what an, an entire water year is supposed to do. Um, and, you know, it, we had a rain event last night, you know, so the kind of the, the beat continues. This is something that our hydrologist Andy Dixon put together, and this is a great graph showing this is a five-year rolling total precipitation trend. You know, so what, what's going on here is as each month ticks off, we add a new month on the front end, we delete a month off the back end, and you can see since 1999, we've been pretty much on a straight upshot of total precipitation. It is, it is increasing with time uh, month by month by month. And in, in the last few years here, you can see that it's, it's quite a steep rise. I mean, there's other steep rises in this trace, uh, but when you add that to what we've been doing since 99, it's it's really no wonder why we're in the state we're in. So this is, uh, you know, just a, a look at Lake Michigan Huron, you know, kind of in the middle of, of the basin. <clears throat> and so what you're looking at here is the average level in red uh, across the board, and you're looking at monthly mean plots of water level of Lake Michigan Huron. Um, so you can see they're, you know, they're all over the place. We've had high water years in 29, 52, 74. The, the peak was in 1986. Uh, we had a big flood across central lower Michigan that almost knocked out a couple of the biggest dams in the state um, that contributed to that high water level. Um, you know, so the white line is where we're at now. Um, the last few days here on Michigan Huron, we've been at, been at 581.67, and that's also the, the monthly mean so far and we're almost at the end of the month. Um, so the thing to take away from this is, you know, a couple different things. Where we stand now, there have been very few months in the last 100 years, which is what this chart is, that we've been at this level. You know, so <clears throat> uh, there's a couple months in 74, there's a few months in 86, and there was a couple months from last summer where we were higher than we are now. The projection is to, to go at least as what we, as high as what we were last summer, if not higher. Um, the other thing to take away is look at where we were in the yellow bottom there in January 2013. We were at a lake elevation of 576.02 feet, and we rose last July to 581.92. That's almost six feet. So if you were standing on the lake shore on Lake Michigan anywhere in January of 2013 and you jumped it to July of 19, the water would be over your head if you're under about 511. Uh, that is a massive jump. Uh, the amount of water to do that is almost unfathomable. Um, and that's, that's kind of why we're, we're at where we're at. So this is uh, an overview of Lake Michigan here on now. What you're looking at here, record lows uh, are in brown, record highs are up in purple. Uh, the normal flow or the normal levels of Lake Michigan are in blue. Um, you know, so there's a, an annual cycle that goes on. Um, spring rains and snow melt into the system produce rises in the, in the spring and we peak in the summer and it falls off as, as we head into winter and we, we turn, you know, more precipitation to snow, that kind of thing. So 
the annual cycle goes on. You can see that in the record highs, the record lows, and the normals. Uh, the actual levels that what we've been doing since uh, the spring of 18 are in red. Uh, one thing to take away there is what has happened to the red line, the actual line, since mid-2019. We have been pretty much holding steady. We didn't have our typical fall off, which is not good heading into this summer. Um, we are sitting at record levels right now, and we've been there for about three months, and we are projected in the green forecast line to stay at record uh, the next four to five months. Uh, the, the hatched area in red is, is kind of the spread of the forecast. Um, so the, the spread is solidly in, in record level as we go through the summer. So this is just a quick view of the other lakes, uh, Superior, Erie, and Ontario. Uh, Superior, Superior and Erie are both doing similar things. They are near record level or above it, and the forecast is to stay there into the summer as well. Lake Ontario is, is a little bit below, but you can see their forecast spread even touches uh, record levels midsummer as well. So the entire Great Lakes Basin is, is up is, is kind of the takeaway. So what, you know, moving into now, kind of, that's kind of the state of the Great Lakes. Now, um, in the short term, water level rises. Um, how do we get them and, and how do we deal with them a little bit? Uh, you know, two major ways that we, we produce short term water level rises. One, I won't spend a whole lot of time on uh, because it's, you know, kind of a given. We, we kind of all know how this works. Low pressure systems and optic storms moving through the Great Lakes um, produce essentially a, a storm surge. You know, when, when you produce a, a strong southwest wind on Lake Michigan and the water pushes into the, you know, the, the Michigan side of the lake or up into the UP, uh, that stretch of, of land, that, that's it's a surge. It, it goes on as long as the wind is there. Once the wind ceases, the, the lake moves back to, you know, more of an equilibrium. Um, so that's a storm surge. The, the other short-term water level rises, uh, you know, and that, that can be more on on days in terms of synoptic storms. The shorter term, more in hours, is what's produced by thunderstorms. We get both meteor tsunamis and stations. Uh, the radar image here produced a, a pretty good sash, um from uh, the May 31st, 1998 derecho that swept Lake Michigan early in the morning that day. Um, I'm going to spend more time here on meteor tsunamis, though, because it's it's kind of a newer thing in the Great Lakes. I'm not sure a lot of forecasters have heard of it. Um, I'm not an expert on it, but I, I have been looking at it quite a bit. We had a, a heck of an event up in the Ludington, Manistee area a couple springs ago, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. So synoptic storms, just kind of one slide on this. Um, you know, it's... It, it's the total water level change that produces the issues, uh, and, and we're going to be dealing with that tonight on Lake Michigan, especially in the Chicago, uh, northern Indiana, Grand Rapids areas, and a north-northwest flow. So the to total water level change is dictated by our already high lake levels, essentially the surge that is produced by the wind that blows over the lake for 12, 24, 36 hours, uh, sometimes longer, and then the wave setup, the, the breaking waves, on top of that. So it's, it's kind of a, a three-pronged uh, factor that you're looking at. The, the already high lake levels, the surge from the wind, and the breaking waves on top of it. This, this wave here, I'll play this again. This is from Pier Cove, Michigan, uh, which is in the southern Grand Rapids CWA. This is from last fall on a survey that I was on, um, you know, kind of looking at what, what the lake levels were doing. And this was, you know, one of the bigger ones that surged into this spot. Um, and I, I did jump up a couple steps. It, it freaked me out a little bit. Um, it, you know, was was a good push of water. And not every wave is doing this. You know, one one of my one of the things I looked at uh, waves on the Great Lakes. The average wave period is about four seconds. So if, if you do the simple math in a 12-hour period in a storm, you're looking at about 10,000 waves into the shoreline at any one given point. Not every wave is going to look like the wave that I played here in this video. But the, the takeaway is the erosion is constantly going on. Um, even though some of the waves are smaller than that in, in the wave spectrum, um, you're, you're constantly uh, eroding the beach and the dune, um, especially in the bigger events when we get the gale force winds and storm force winds. So moving on to, you know, kind of the shorter term rises, 
Uh, I kind of covered what a storm surge is, or at least what I consider a storm surge. It's more of a synoptic system. Um, a meteor tsunami is actually a, a propagating wave that is moving through the lake uh, versus a seish, which is a standing wave oscillation. You know, on, in a seish, one side of the lake is rising, the other side of the lake is falling. Um, for years, I think uh, we as forecasters have kind of considered all of this to be a seish, and I've been in Grand Rapids since 1995, and that was my thought until I attended a conference on this. I was invited to it back in 2017 in Ann Arbor, and that kind of changed my mind significantly. Um, I wasn't really up on this, and, you know, so that's kind of one of my key points here is to try to share this across the Great Lakes so people know what's going on here. I, I think this is a, it's an area of research that is expanding, uh, kind of led by folks at uh, UW-Madison. Um, and uh, so I attended this conference in, in 17, and in, interestingly enough, the, the next spring in 2018, we had a serious meteor tsunami event into Ludington, uh, which is a decent-sized town in our, our northwest CWA, west central lower Michigan. And this is a, a picture from that. Um, there was a photographer on the beach um, that snapped these, these photos. Um, the the eight-foot drop and seven-foot rise that I'm, I'm indicating here was actually recorded at a water level gauge uh, that we don't have access to, but it's at the Ludington Pump Storage, which is about uh, two miles to the south of this lighthouse, to the left of the picture. Um, they, they recorded an eight-foot drop followed by a seven-foot rise. Uh, you know, a couple anecdotal stories here. Um, there were two people that were working on the reservoir. So Ludington Pump Storage is a reservoir that sits up in the dunes. They they pull water in, uh, I think, through the day, and then at night they, they pump it back out through the turbines and create electricity off it. It's, it's really kind of an engineering marvel. But they had two divers up on the top of the dune as this was going on, and they could not believe their eyes, you know, as, as the water – you know, retreated away from the shore and was uncovering all kinds of sand. They, they had no idea, had never seen anything like it um, in all their years up there. And then all of a sudden, the, you know, the waves and the water rushed back in, uh, almost went into their parking lot. Um, and you can see here at Ludington, this is the city beach in Ludington, it actually uncovered the pier and then buried it. Uh, one of the people that were on the beach, uh, a, a TV meter, a meteorologist and I interviewed her, uh, resident of Ludington all her life, uh, walks the pier all the time. I, I grew up in a beach town, St. Joseph, Michigan, and in beach towns, people walk the pier. It, it's kind of something you do on a, on a summer night. She's done this all her life. She said she will never walk on the pier again based on what she saw. And I, I've seen videos of, of the event from Ludington, and it's really impressive. So, you know, one of, one of the takeaways is, you know, if you're trying to get your head wrapped around a seish versus a, a medio tsunami, a seish is going to be a slow rise as the lake oscillates back toward your location, it, it's going to be a, a slow creep up the beach. A meteor tsunami is coming in at the speed of the wave. And the speed of the wave in, in this one was directly tied to the speed of the atmospheric wave. And the, the little thunderstorm complex that was, was producing this was moving at 71 miles an hour. So a 71 mile an hour move, moving wave is going to be difficult to get out of the way of, and that's why it, it freaked all the people out that, that saw it. So this, this rise fall occurred in the matter of minutes. So this is a simulation that was produced of the event uh, from the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. Um, the folks at Ludington Pump Storage observed two waves, and in this uh, simulation, it it also produced two waves. So here's the first wave coming in right around midday. And, you know, it was within, you know, within that same hour, the second wave hit. And uh, it produced uh, a lot of flooding into Ludington. It produced a bunch of damage into Manistee uh, as, as the water pushed through the pier heads in Manistee. It wrecked a bunch of docks and, and marinas uh, as, it, as it came in. So this, this is a view of it, uh, nothing spectacular um, in, in terms of the convection that we see in the, the Great Lakes. It's the middle storm that's responsible for the meteor tsunami. Um, and what we're surmising and, and talking to other people that we feel that this was probably uh, a gravity wave packet, if not uh, inertia gravity wave packet. Um, 
and reading a little bit about those, they're, they're produced by very strong uh, systems that are ejecting out of the Rockies um, associated with deep low pressure systems. And this was a day before we had a sleet and icing event, uh, you know, winter storm in Michigan. You know, so we, we feel this kind of developed out in the plains overnight. It actually kicked off a, a supercell in northeast Iowa. Uh, that was producing big hail in northeast high, Iowa, raced across Wisconsin, and moved out over Lake Michigan and swept into Ludington about midday. Um, so anytime we see this kind of wave packet to the, the convection, you know, our, our eyes are, are kind of looking at water level gauges and, and pressure gauges, actually, and I'll show you that here in a minute. So this, this is the pressure jump that occurred at the NOS station in Ludington. The same thing occurred on the Wisconsin side of the lake. Both uh, stations observed a 10 millibar pressure jump, which is significant. Uh, three to five millibars is a, is a pretty good jump. 10 is, is excellent. Um, you, you can produce medial tsunamis with, with pressure jumps on the order of three to five. So this was, you know, more than valid to, to produce uh, a medial tsunami. So one of the things that uh, Glyrill and, and other folks looked at was we need we need one minute data we need pressure data uh, as as kind of a, a red flag as to tipping us off that this is going on I reached out to Glyrill last week um, they and I was aware of this they put in four extra pressure sensors on the Wisconsin side of the lake so they're they're trying to ring Southern Lake Michigan which is kind of a hot spot for this um, I would say Southern Lake Michigan from about Ludington South and then Lake Erie are kind of the hot spots based on water depth. Um, but they, they put in extra pressure sensors to try to, to get a hold of this as, as it's happening. So we've, we've got a bunch of buoys, we've, we have a bunch of shoreline stations, and they're looking at trying to, to get this to a website or a way that it can tip us off that one of these pressure jumps has moved through a location to let us know that it you know, could potentially be uh, ripe for a medial tsunami. So how this works, you know, I, uh, this this visual is, is kind of what really uh, got through to me. Um, you know, so you're looking for a, a moving atmospheric disturbance that that is creating a wave. So when when you're looking at an actual tsunami, what creates the the total water column change is is the earthquake. The the shift in the bottom creates the wave. Well, how how in the heck are you doing that on Lake Michigan with a thunderstorm? And the answer is the pressure jump. Essentially, what's happening is as, as that pressure jump moves out of the lake, it's, it's creating a divot on the water surface. And, and that divot is moving at, at a certain speed. Um, the shallow water wave equation uh, kind of dictates whether or not this thing is going to do something spectacular or not. And what occurred in April of 18 in Ludington was just that case. So you're looking at the, uh, the simple equation there of, C equals the square root of G times H. H is the water depth. So you can solve for the water depth that the wave will, will get into a good resonance, um, if that makes sense. So the bottom line is, think about it as, uh, you know, somebody swinging on a swing. If, if your legs are not in rhythm, you're not going to build the arc. If your legs are in rhythm, it, it's in resonance, and, and you, can, you can grow the wave. And that's, that's what happened with this event. So you can look at Lake Michigan, you can look at the bottom, the bathymetry, and find out what kind of speed you need to produce this resonance. And unfortunately for the folks in Ludington and Manistee, this, this had the right depth and it, it increased in height um, and, and produced, you know, some damage into our neck of the woods. Um, so what Glyrill did is they, they looked at the bottom and they produced uh, the speed that you would need to, to get thunderstorm complexes into resonance. Um, and I'm assuming that they, they may have done this for the entire Great Lakes. So the deeper, the deeper the lake, the faster the speed you need for it to get into resonance. So Lake Superior, this, this is a harder thing to, to do. Lake Ontario is pretty deep. Uh, lake Erie is very shallow, so it takes a, a lower uh, speed to, to get these into a resonance where uh, meteor tsunamis will occur. On, on southern Lake Michigan, you know, essentially from uh, the northern parts of Milwaukee CWA to the southern parts of Green Bay CWA, you know, we're looking at 50 to 65 knots of speed to, to get these complexes into a resonance that, that produces meteor tsunamis. So, and that's, I mean, obviously that's flying, um, but 
we had it on, on April 13th of 2018. So, you know, what, what you're looking at, uh, at least in our neck of the woods on Southern Lake Michigan, you, you're looking for a high rate of speed thunderstorm complex. Um, again, 71 mile an hour motion on, on the storm that crossed the lake in 2018. Uh, the deeper the, the, the lake, the faster the speed is needed. Uh, and you really need to know whether or not it's producing a, a, a really good pressure jump. That's, that's your, your factor that's creating the total water, water column change. Um, and, you know, I'm going to kind of try to keep working with Glarell to see where they stand with getting us that data in real time. Uh, they got a grant to put those sensors in. And, you know, right now it's more in a research mode, but hopefully that, that comes online as something that we can use in a warning mode at, at some point someday. And then we're, we're using the tide and currents website quite a bit, looking at water level gauges. Um, this is something that in, in my career here since 95, I haven't looked at a whole lot because our, our water levels have been so low for so many years. Uh, but now it's something that it, we look at all the time. So th this is just a, a overview of Ludington, just to kind of give you a picture of, of how this works. You know, you essentially have an open pipe from Lake Michigan back into cities like Ludington that have uh, you know, what, what we call drowned river mouth. This is a, a lake, but it's basically the end of the river. And when you produce a, a medio tsunami that, that's got an eight foot head on it, it's, it's coming through the pier heads and flooding into downtown. Um, and we have many of these port towns all around the Great Lake. Uh, so this, this occurs in quite a few spots. So going into the, the last section here and in, into the, the, the water model that, that I want to touch on, you know, this, this is uh, looking at the observed data. We, we look at these NOS water level gauges. Obviously, they're on the ocean coast, uh, but we also have them in the Great Lakes. Uh, we have two in, in my CWA in Grand Rapids, one up in Ludington that sits back in the channel quite a ways. And this is uh, the end of the pier at Holland, Michigan. This is more, uh, you know, right near the edge of the lake. This used to sit uh, back in Lake Makatawa. They moved it into a much better place that, that can sense water level changes and get a true measure of the water level changes, um, you know, right right at the edge of the, the, the north pier. Uh, we got into an issue at midwinter here, just uh, as an aside, uh, I think we had a, an event where we had 10 to 15 foot waves rolling through the pier, head, pier heads here out of the west, and there was some damage and erosion that occurred on the sidewalks and, and power to the building. So the NOS folks and the power company had to come out and, and look into this and fix it. But we monitor these sites for, for water levels uh, constantly these days. So last few slides here. Uh, the FDCOM water model, this is, it stands for the Finite Volume Community Ocean Model. This has replaced uh, the Princeton Ocean Model, which was in place for many years. I didn't use that a whole lot, as I said, out of Grand Rapids, because we, we had depth of beach. We, we really didn't have an issue. Uh, offices that, that had water level issues, like Detroit, uh, with Saginaw Bay and, and the western end of Lake Erie, Cleveland, Buffalo on Lake Erie, all those offices use that more uh, than we did in Grand Rapids because we just didn't need it. But I'm kind of blown away by the, the goodness of this, this water model. Um, it was produced in combination between the NOS and the folks at Glarill in Ann Arbor. Um, they brought Lake Erie online in 2016. Uh, Michigan Huron came online July of 2019, and they are bringing Superior and Ontario into the mix in 2022. And I think the reason the delay is uh, they, I think they've suspended work on the WCOF system. So that, that has delayed uh, those two lakes coming online. But it forecasts water levels. It forecasts ice uh, formation, uh, currents, temperatures. Uh, it is a 3D sigma coordinate system. So it's train following. It, it will produce uh, really good temperature uh, changes along the coast where we get upwelling events, you know, so this I think is something that will be coming into AWIP hopefully um, in the not too distant future. Um, it's an unstructured grid, so it's spider webbed uh, into straits and around islands and near shores. You can pack more uh, data points uh, and we can get more information out of the areas where we need it. Uh, and it runs out to 120 hours. So one weird event here that we had um, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about something like this until this event. This was December 1st. Uh, it produced top three all-time water levels at Holland and Ludington. Um, 
I think it was the all-time record at Ludington. It was the third highest at Holland. And it was an event where the winds along our shore in western lower Michigan really never peaked over like 15 knots. Um, what happened was there was a, a gale event up in the straits uh, out of the east, and it was flowing a pretty good amount of water from Huron into Michigan over about an uh, 18-hour period. It kind of produced a head of water on the, the northern part of the lake, and that sloshed down, you know, not really sloshed, it kind of crept down the lake in a north flow then through the course of the day. And you can see that here in this water level trace from Holland. Um, so it's kind of this long, slow hump of a, a rise fall, and we, we rose to 582.79 feet, which uh, third highest ever at the site. And, you know, that water levels at the site go back uh, decades and decades, I think close to 100 years. Uh, you know, so the Princeton Ocean model, the old model, treated the lakes as separate lakes. It was like there was a wall at the Straits of, of Mackinac, and... Uh, this model now has opened that up, and we're, we're seeing things that we hadn't seen before. So this is an animation. You can get this off their website. Uh, this is a, a website that's hosted by Glaral, and I, I guess I'll, I'll broach that topic now. There, there's two different versions of the FBCOM that are out there. One is, is ran at Glaral, and it, it's in a, a graphical map-type format. That's what this is here, and it's, it's ran by the the HRRR experimental, um, I think it's version 4, on the front end, and then it's ran by uh, NDFD on the back end. So that's, that's what you see off of this site. Um, and, and you can see the push that was ongoing out of Huron into Michigan, and then you can see the wind flip and the flow goes the other way. So this is uh, the map that's produced, you know, for uh, Michigan-Huron, and you can, you can see in the water levels that uh, this is water levels above low water datum. So you can see that some of the water drained out of Huron is a lower water level, and the, the water levels rose on Lake Michigan. And from what we have found in our neck of the woods, when you get to 1.4, it, it relates to advisory level type impacts. And when we get to 1.6, when it kind of flips to a black color, uh, we, we get into all kinds of issues with port towns backing up water into cities, and uh, we're looking at sandbagging going on in Saugatuck and barricades coming out. Um, so this is just a tool that, um, if you're not using it, uh, it's something that is just pretty awesome. It's something that we really like. So what we've done is we've kind of created a little staff gauge internally on a, uh, a Google Sites page that I put together. And just so the forecasters have a, a quick one-to-one, -one, a, a quick look at, am I at a green level, an advisory level, or a warning level? And um, right now, Water levels are so high that we are flirting with advisory almost every day of the week, no matter what the wind, wind or waves are doing. Um, we're, we're pretty much right there. Uh, this morning we rose, uh, already to, in, into advisory level. We're up about 582.5 right now at Ludington and Holland. Um, so we're a little concerned what may occur here tonight as the winds flip north and increase the gale force. So this, uh, I think this is my final slide. This, this is the NOS version. This is what you get off the tides and currents page. Um, and this is more of a, a graph type format. It, it produces forecasts for every buoy and, and water level site around the Great Lakes. So if you have a buoy in your area, it produces this graph. This is Michigan City. I grabbed this earlier this morning for the overnight run. Um, it should be interesting to see what goes down, uh, in IWX's CWA and our CWA. We've got warnings out. Um, it's already at an advisory level, you know, so the stuff up on top is on my internal Google Sites page, and those are, are locally um, defined, you know, we're, we're kind of adjusting those as we go as we get into these water level situations, but you can see that the model is, is, is forecasting that they're already at an advisory level to start uh, in the overnight here, and that they're rising above what I would consider a warning level. I'm not sure I've seen any of our sites to this height. Uh, we'll see if it pans out. Um, since I've been looking at this last uh, late summer, I'm not sure I've ever seen it go to five and a quarter. So Michigan City, St. Joe, South Haven may be under the gun later tonight. Um, this version is driven completely off the GFS from what I know. It may have some high-res stuff initially, but it's driven on the back end by the GFS. The reason they did that is they wanted pressure data in it uh, for meteor tsunami, um, you know, trying to forecast that with the models. Um, 
both versions, though, from what I've seen, have had pretty similar results uh, from event to event. Um, so, yeah, this is just a screen grab from our internal Google Sites page that I put together for forecasters to kind of monitor this stuff. Um, so I think that that is all I have. Um, I'll kick it back to you, Jim. <laughs>